out this morning. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to visit with you. Um, we're going to continue this, this morning our study of the book of Revelation. And um, uh, for those of you who have not been here, I'm going to not give a whole long uh, review of this, but I'll give a very thematic review of kind of where we have been with the study of the book of Revelation. We have been studying the book of Revelation because I think it's an important study. It's an important study because it is a great message of hope for the church. It was specifically intended for the first century church who was about to undergo severe persecution by the Roman Empire. And what God is doing in the book of Revelation, contrary to what I think a lot of people think about the book of Revelation being, the book of Revelation is not an end time book where the book of Revelation is talking about a, a big war that's going to occur in Israel. Rather, the book of Revelation is really about the deliverance of God's people from the Roman Empire and giving them a great message of hope that despite the persecution they were going to face, God would eventually judge the Roman Empire. The way we have looked at this, and again, Brad and I who have been ping-ponging this study back and forth, well, we submit this humbly to you. It's our belief that this is what the book of Revelation is. Of course, we understand there are different views, and we understand those are sincerely held. But we think that the, what is really neat about the book of Revelation is that it uses a lot of Old Testament imagery. Quotes, we've looked at many of them out of the book of, out of the Old Testament. And whenever we go back and we look at what the Old Testament quotes are and what those verses refer to, we know then that whenever we're talking about the book of Revelation, we're talking about the judgment of Rome. We're talking about the judgment of a nation, and that is what the book of Revelation has been about. We've talked about a lot of things. Has, the book of Revelation is chock full of stuff. We've, we've seen the throne room of God. We've seen the enemies of God. We've seen the persecution of the church. We've seen all kinds of things. And now we come to chapter 19. We're in the last four books of the book of Revelation, so we're almost there. We come to chapter 19, and we get to the rejoicing of God's people. Brad talked about last time in Revelations chapter 18 that Babylon has fallen. Remember, that's the great word in Revelations chapter 18. Babylon has fallen. And we talked about the fact that there was no Babylon when Revelation was written. It had already been destroyed. And that Babylon is a reference to an evil kingdom. That's what uh, the book of the Old Testament constantly uh, uses the Babylon imagery to refer to uh, evil kingdoms or evil folks. And so Babylon is a reference to Rome. And remember we talked about, it talks about the city that sat on seven hills, which is clearly Rome and all kinds of stuff that just, just really tell us that this is about Rome. And so in chapter 18, God judges Rome. And it says that Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And what we get now, and what we're going to study today in chapter 19, is we get a picture of the rejoicing of God's people. And it's, it's just a wonderful picture. There's a lot in this chapter, and so I want to get right into it. But this is God's people rejoicing over the judgment of Rome, over the, 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 the justification or justice coming to God's people because of what Rome had done to them and what, what the feeling is about that. So we're going to start in the first two verses of Revelation chapter 19. It says there, and after these things, this is John speaking in his vision, after these things I heard a great voice of a bunch of people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Hand. Again, we talked about this a few chapters back. There's this image of a prostitute, or as the Bible, the King James Version refers to a whore. And we talked about the fact that that imagery and what is said about that imagery is clearly a reference to Rome and the Roman Empire and what the Roman Empire was doing to Christians at this time. And so here the people of God say, Alleluia, praise and glory and honor to God because he has just judged Rome, like we read about in Revelation chapter 18. Now, the people in heaven, these people in heaven that we're talking about here that are rejoicing, we've seen them before. And if you'll turn over to Revelations chapter 7 and verse number 9, Revelations chapter 7 and verse number 9, the Bible says, And after this I beheld in low a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And so this is the people that are there in heaven. These are the folks that are sitting there in heaven, and it's God's people. I mean, we, we, we can just read that imagery and know that. We've talked in more detail when we studied the book of chapter 7 about why that's the case. But here are people with palms in their hand. They've got white robes and white linens. And the Bible, the Bible is clearly referring to God's people here, God's people standing before his throne. 
Now, alleluia is a word that we use a lot. Uh, maybe you've said uh, things like uh, hallelujah, like, you know, when something goes your way. Uh, sorry, Jer Jeremy, it's not working. Did I kill it? Now, I'm going to talk a lot louder now. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to be quiet. <laughs> all right. So, uh, sorry for all those on the live stream if you weren't able to hear that. Uh, you haven't missed too much. Alleluia is a word that we read a lot uh, and we say a lot. You may use the word hallelujah in your life a lot. And I think it's important sometimes that we're careful about what it is that we're saying. The word alleluia or hallelujah means praise be to God or praise be to the Lord. Now, I'll leave it up to you, but when it, you know, if your blender is not working this morning and all of a sudden it starts working, you know, maybe not the time to use hallelujah. You know, that's, that's probably not a cause for rejoicing in heaven. Or if your favorite football team scores a touchdown whenever you thought they weren't, maybe not the best time to say praise be God or whatever. But the point of the matter is this word in this phrase, is the, this is God's people saying praise God. They are pouring out praise to God for what he has done. They were commanded to rejoice. Brad talked about this in Revelation chapter 18. The chapter right before this, you'll remember that whenever, um, and Jeremy, you may want to kill this because I've got, yeah. Uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse number 20, whenever God is judging the Roman Empire, he says, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. So again, though God's people were commanded to rejoice, and now in Revelation chapter 19, we're seeing them rejoice. They are obeying this command to rejoice over the justice of that God has brought. Now, you notice that the first reason for praise is not the vengeance. The first reason for praise in Revelation chapter 19 is for true and righteous are his judgments. You know, it's one thing to praise God because he's got brute force. He can do anything he wants. That's certainly true. We'll talk more about that. But what makes God truly unbelievable and, and, and so perfect and holy is that everything that he does is true and righteous. There have been powerful people, not as powerful as God, but there have been very powerful people who are not true and righteous. There have been dictators that have ruled empires that are not true and righteous. Rome, which this book is all about, was exceedingly powerful, but there was nothing true or righteous about Rome. They were lighting Christians on fire as street lamps. And so God is here juxtaposed or sat beside the Roman Empire. And what, one of the, the first reason that, he, that people are told to, to praise God, to say hallelujah, is not because God was victorious, that was great, but it was because true and righteous are his judgments. God's true and he's righteous. In the 103rd Psalm and in the 6th verse, the 103rd Psalm and in the 6th verse, there the psalmist says this about, about God, if I can get over there. He says, the Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. You know, that's what truly makes God who he is. His perfect holy being is that God is pure justice. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your lot in life is. It doesn't matter what your station in life is. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, important or not important in your eyes. However that might be. God executes judgment and righteousness and love and mercy for everyone. True and righteous are his judgments. And what a wonderful thought that is. John chapter 5 and 30 also talks about this thought, and as, long as, as well as Romans 2 and 2. We're not going to read all the verses because I don't want to go too long this morning, but I've got them up there, and you're certainly welcome to the PowerPoint if you'd like more references later on. So, but praises also do because their prayers for justice have been answered. So it's not just that he's true and righteous, but it is that he's actually executed judgment. Remember in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, whenever God's people were being persecuted, in verse number 9 it says, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So this is God's people who have been persecuted by the Roman Empire, and we get this imagery of them sitting under the altar there in heaven and saying, God, how long is it going to be until you avenge and, and, and take judgment on Rome? And that's what the book of Revelation is about. The book of Revelation is the answer to that question. It is God executing judgment on the Roman Empire and eventually bringing its fall and destruction. And so here God has answered these prayers and he has actually done vengeance. Now, the thing about vengeance 
is that vengeance belongs to God. Sometimes we like to execute vengeance. And, 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 and sometimes we think vengeance feels good. You know, I've used this analogy before, but, uh, you know, in a movie, whenever there's a lot of bad guys and the bad guys are getting their way and they're doing all kinds of things that are unjust and unfair and, and, and hurting good people, and then, you know, invariably, in the magic of movies at the end, the good guys all of a sudden come and, and they execute judgment and we go, yeah, that's right, get them. Well, yeah, that's right, and that, there, we do have a certain innate sense of justice that we like, but we need to be careful in this life. Because vengeance is not ours. There may be things around you that you don't like. There may be things that you see that people are doing that you think are inconsistent with the Word of God. And yes, we can talk about those things and we can instruct people and persuade people to try and do things better. But ultimately, vengeance is not ours. Because let me tell you something. When somebody commits a sin, it's not against Donnie. It's not. I mean, Donnie may be upset, but it ain't against Donnie. It's not. It's not against Jeremy. It's not against any of us. It's against God. That's who got transgressed. That's who got offended. And so you and I might be upset about some of the things in this world. It's not about you. It's about God. And so God gets to execute vengeance, and God executes vengeance here. It wasn't for his people. It was for God to do that. In Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse number 27. Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse number 27, a, a, a very powerful verse here. It says, but a, uh, it says there, we'll go up to 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the judgment of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I love that verse and the reason of that passage. The reason I do is because it sets out all of this. It says that whenever somebody commits sin... Okay, when, and whenever Brother Donnie, I'm sorry, Donnie, to keep picking on you, but it's my, it's my nature. So Brother Donnie, whenever Brother Donnie's trying to persuade somebody to try and do something right, and they reject what Brother Donnie says, it's not about Brother Donnie. I mean, Brother Donnie may be upset. He may be upset that somebody didn't kind of, you know, listen to what he has to say, but that's not the offense. Here, Hebrews tells us that the offense is, is that they have counted the blood of Jesus unworthy. That the blood of Jesus doesn't mean anything to them. They're not willing to alter their life or to mold their life after Christ because they don't judge what he has done is worthy of compelling them to change their life. As Christians, we believe that when we look at the cross and we see Christ, that compels us. The Bible says the love of Christ constrains us to be different. And so the offense is not to us, it's to God. And so vengeance belongs to me. So here, God executes his vengeance. James chapter 4 and verse number 11. James chapter 4 and verse number 11, the Bible there says, Speak not evil of one another, brother, and he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? We need to be careful about that. You know, uh, I'm a lawyer, so you can hold that against me. You know, I've had cases, trials in front of the court. How do you think the judge would feel if I was sitting in court and the other side's witness was testifying and I said, objection, your honor. And then I ran up to the front, pushed the judge out of his chair, sat down in the chair and said, sustained. You think the judge would be happy about that? The judge would probably go, uh, what are you doing up here? And I'd probably be sanctioned. May not get to practice his court again. Why? Because I've usurped his authority. Okay, that's what we do with God when we try and take our vengeance. We say, God, look at this, and then we run and push God off the throne, and we say, I'm going to take vengeance. No, that's not our place. There's one lawgiver. That's God. And so we need to let him execute vengeance, and he does here. Moving on to verse number three. And again, they say, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever, talking about the smoke that comes from this destruction of Rome. Um, in chapter 18, you'll remember God's judgment of Rome, we talked about last time, is depicted as that city being put on fire or being burned. And here it says that that, Fire is going to continue forever, which is quite a, an amazing imagery when we think about that. Now, does, now, you think about fire and brimstone. We have other imagery of that. Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, was killed by fire and brimstone or, or judged by fire and brimstone. And in Jude, verse number 7, 
Jude, verse number 7, it says there, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, there's a lot of debate about where Sodom and Gomorrah is. I think most people believe it's a, it was a settlement that was somewhere near the Dead Sea in Israel. You will look in vain if you go out to Israel and have never been there. But I understand that if you go out there, you're not going to see Sodom and Gomorrah on fire. Uh, the reason is because that fire went out a long time ago. So what is it talking about this eternal fire? Because Rome exists today. It's not on fire, literally. And, of course, we know this is a symbol anyway. But, but Rome is a, a city, a very large city. So what does it mean, an eternal fire? What it means is God's judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah is an eternal thing that people can... We're still talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't know where it's at, but we know the story. And we understand what it means, and we understand the point of it. And that's the same thing with Rome. Rome's judgment stands forever. And we're able now, even 2,000 years later, to sit here and talk about the fact that Rome was judged and how God's justice was executed about the, around the nation of Rome. Edom, in Isaiah chapter 34 and verse number 9, just so we can see some of the similar imagery that gets used here. This is another example of that. In Isaiah chapter 34 and verse number 9, it says there, it says, "...and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch." And the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So again, talking about the judgment of Edom, it uses very similar imagery. So here we're just talking about this judgment of Rome that will stand forever or for a long time. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, it says, And the four and twenty elders... And the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So what I, what's interesting about this is you'll realize the book of Revelation kind of is, it, not kind of, it's very consistent. We now come to these characters that we study way back in the book of Revelation. You'll remember we were talking about the throne room of God when we got to see what the throne room of God looked like in Revelation chapter 4. Whenever we're sitting there in the throne room of God and John is describing what he's seeing, he describes these four and twenty elders and he describes these four beasts that sit around God's throne that are there to praise God continually. And here they are again, we're reintroduced to them, and they're again in this time of rejoicing, sitting around God's throne saying, Amen, Alleluia, and praising Him. And so God is being worshipped on His throne, as I said, we return to this. I think it's interesting that it says both small and great. You know, that's important. The reason it was important to the church is because there were not many great people in the church, and I don't mean great as in good people. There were a lot of fantastic people if we're talking about quality. But if we're talking about power, if we're talking about position in life, if we're talking about, you know, kind of the earthly trappings of being great, there weren't a lot of those in the church. There were a whole bunch of those in Rome. I mean, Caesar was immensely powerful. Brad talked about some of the opulence of Caesar last time. Remember that? You know, he never wore the same thing twice. And, you know, his horses, like, were, you know, covered in gold and silver and all this crazy stuff. I mean, just amazing, amazing wealth and power that Caesar had. And the church... You know, it, it, you know, if you think about it, 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 it was really awful because Rome was all-powerful. There were legions and legions of, of, of soldiers, and they could come into a poor Christian's hovel, just their hut, and yank them out of there and put them to the sword and persecute them and kill them, maybe in horrific ways. And you can just imagine a Christian feeling ultimately powerless in front of all that. And here... What God is saying is, is I'm here for both the small and the great. Everybody gets to worship me if they follow me. In Romans chapter 10 and in verse number 12, Romans chapter 10 and in verse number 12, there the Apostle Paul says this. He says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Folks, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your past, past is. It doesn't matter what degree you got or what degree you don't have or how much money you have in your bank account or you don't have or what kind of house you have or you don't have. None of that matters. None of it. All that matters for you to have a relationship with God is whether you follow him or not. That's it. It's up to you. It's open to all, both small and great. Galatians chapter 3 and in verse number 28. Galatians chapter 3 and in verse number 28. There the Apostle Paul says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
And if you be in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. God's promises for everybody, and everybody, if they worship God, was able to sit around this throne praising God in the throne room. Now, many take the last chapters of Revelation. This is some of the alternative views of Revelation. Many take these last chapters, and they begin to talk about a concept of this time when Jesus is going to return to earth, and he's going to reign for a thousand years, and God will reign over the earth for a thousand years. Um, and that's, that's something that is a very prominent theory. That's one of the things that we think the book of Revelation is not about, and we're going to talk more about that because these are the verses, these are the chapters where a lot of people get what we call today premillennialism or this idea of a thousand-year reign comes out of these chapters. And again, that's taking the book of Revelation literally when it was never meant to be taken literally. This is clearly a symbolic book, and it's clearly about Rome, we think. But many take, that way, take it that way. But let me just, whoa, wow, that was amazing. That went really fast. Uh, there we go. The thing about that is that God's not going to come back to reign. God's already reigning. Okay? There's no need for God to come down on earth and set up a, a throne or Jesus to set up his throne. Jesus is already reigning. He has been reigning for a long time. He has been reigning for before the world, or actually as the world began. In the 10th Psalm and in the 16th verse, the 10th Psalm and in the 16th verse, we'll just read a couple of these. It says there, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his hand. There's never been a time when God hasn't been king. There's never been a time when Jesus hasn't been reigning beside him. In the 47th Psalm and in the 7th verse, the 47th Psalm and in the 7th verse, the Bible says this, For God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. God is already reigning. So there's not this need for God to come down and reign on earth. That is something that's already occurred, and here the Bible is clearly showing God already reigning over everyone. We'll talk more about that as we go through these next uh, verses and into chapter 20 next time. Now, verses 7 through 9. It says there that, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So this rejoicing's going on. You've got God on his throne. The four beasts are worshiping. The 24 elders are worshiping. And all of a sudden now, they said, come, let's go to a feast. The marriage of the Lamb is ready. You know, um, I don't know how you feel about where you'd rather be, uh, but when we talk about the destruction of Rome and what Brad talked about last time and some of the other imagery in, in Revelation... Boy, that's not a good place to be. I I wouldn't want to be there. The Bible describes it, that whenever the judgment of Rome is going to come, the Bible talks about the fact that that men are going to cry for rocks to fall on them, that that they'll just want to be hidden from God. And let me tell you something. As bad as the destruction of Rome was and the fall of that is, it's going to be that in a million times more on the day of judgment. And here we've got this contrast, right? So you've got all the misery that's going on in Rome that Brad talked about last time. It's burning and it's never going to stop and people are wailing and all kinds of stuff. And then we've got in heaven a marriage feast. Now, usually, unless unless you've got a real strong objection to it, uh, usually marriages are a happy occasion. I don't know, maybe you've been to some where you went, this is a bad idea. But, you know, normally marriages are a happy occasion. And so normally when people get married and we go to a wedding, people are happy. People are, are, are nice to each other. People are shaking hands and whatever. It's a, it's a happy, joyous occasion. And that's the point of this imagery here is that what's going on in heaven is joyous like a marriage feast. I mean, this is something that's very, very exciting and very joyous. The people of God are rejoicing because of this. So we have this wedding imagery uh, that we've got here. Now, it, 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 the other thing that's interesting is they talk about the bride and the bride being clothed in white linen. And think about how that contrasts to, again, this imagery of of the prostitute that the Bible talks about in Revelation 17 and verse number 4 that says she's clothed in scarlet. And, you know, a very different imagery from what we see here for the bride that is prepared for the wedding feast. Uh, The bride is clearly meant to reflect God's people. Uh, The relationship between God and Christ with the church is often described as a marriage, and we know that. I've got a few verses here. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse number 8. Back in the Old Testament, when God was referring to his people, he often referred to it in terms of a marriage. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse number 8, it says there, Now when I passed by, 
uh, and looked upon thee. Behold, thy time was, was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed thee away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. So here God's talking about his people, and he, and he relates it to a marriage. And notice he says, I washed you white again. I washed you clean. And here God's people are referred to as clean. Again, that imagery of being washed by God or being justified or sanctified by God. Again, not because of what we have done, but because God has washed us. Not because we've lived perfectly. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 23, Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 23, a very famous passage about uh, Christ and the church, but again referring to this marriage imagery, we'll read this in verse number 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. Listen, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here, when he's talking about marriage, he's kind of giving a dual t uh, teaching. He's clearly talking about the relationship of husbands and wives together, but at the same time, he's talking about the relationship of Christ and the church and using those to teach about each other. And so here, God, in, in Paul, in speaking by the inspired word of God, is referring or relating to the relationship of Christ and the church as that of a marriage relationship and how Christ loved the church like a husband should love its wife and so on and so forth. Talks there that he washed the church. Again, this notion of cleansing the church and making it pure and holy like we see in the book of Revelation chapter 19. So again, this idea is God, this, this joyous occasion where Christ is reunited or, or, or has a big marriage celebration with his people, the church, is the imagery here. In verse number 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. This is the angel. And he said unto me, See thou not, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren and have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here John is obviously overcome by the joyous vision. He's sitting and watching all of this happiness. And John spontaneously decides that he's going to fall down and worship this angel that's shown him all this. The, the reaction of the angel, I think, is interesting. The angel goes, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, I'm not God. You don't worship me. You only worship God. And I think that's an important thing for us to just stop and listen as, 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 as we think about this passage. It, 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 as a matter of fact, John does it again. He gets so consumed that in the last chapter of Revelation, he does it again. He falls down and he worships, and the angel gives him the same thing. Get up off your knees. I'm not God. Worship God. So, again, we have to only worship God and not man. You know, in Matthew chapter 4 and in verse number 10, Matthew chapter 4 and in verse number 10, the Bible says this, Then said Jesus unto them, Get thee hence, this is Jesus being tempted, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. There is one person that we are to worship. That's God. Now, unfortunately, in our life, we worship a lot of things, whether we admit it or not. I mean, we worship all kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, sometimes it may be in a marriage relationship. I mean, Christy worships me. No, I'm kidding. She, no, um, she's not here. She's attending church in Austin with Brian, uh, so that, I can say that. But, um, uh, but no, we worship a lot of things. It may be a sports team. It may be uh, our bank account. It may be our possessions. It may be some other trapping of this life. But whether we, wh whether we want to acknowledge or not, sometimes we worship those things. We give ourselves to them. We sacrifice for them. We praise them. We need to be careful because there's only one thing for us to worship in this life, and that's God. Nobody else and no other thing is worthy of worship. And uh, not angels, as this was. This was an angel that was showing John this, uh, this, this revelation. And in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse number 18, Colossians chapter 2 and in verse number 18, Paul says this, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a, vol in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. 
And so, you know, there, back in the first century, there were people who were so enamored with angels, they began to worship them. And Paul says, don't do that. Angels are not to be worshipped. We're also, of course, not to worship the apostles. That happened in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 25. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 25, the Bible says, And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. We're not to worship the apostles. Chris and I had the opportunity to go uh, over to Europe one time, and I'm not going to get into which church it was or whatever, but let's just say that we went into a place of worship, and there was a statue, and it was a statue of Peter. There was a line that went on forever to just go by the statue. And I'm sitting there going, well, I can see it from here. Why would everybody get in line to go to? Well, as these people came to the statue, they would kiss the feet of the statue and just break down crying. I mean, just overcome with emotion. You know what they were doing? They were worshiping Peter. Worse, they were worshiping a piece of metal that was supposed to look like Peter. That was it. They were worshiping a man. Folks, we are not to do that. Peter himself said not to do that. We are to only worship God, and we need to be careful that we do that in our lives. Only God, and here's the point. If you're not going to worship angels, and you're not going to worship apostle, let me tell you who else you're not going to worship. Caesar. And remember, we talked about the imagery in the book of Revelation, and a lot of what the book of Revelation is talking about is the fact that the Roman Empire made its subjects worship Caesar as God. And there were temples that were, that were made and erected to these Caesars. And it was commanded that if you wanted to have a place in Roman society, as we've talked about previously, you had to bend the knee to Caesar and not just say he's king, but confess him as God, as Lord. And here the Bible is saying, no more. There is only one thing that is worthy of worship, and that is God. Not Caesar, not apostles, not angels. In verses 11 through 13, the Bible says, And I saw heaven opened. I lo- this is... This is it, let me, it. Okay, so if you like movies and you like the point where the good guy finally comes and he gets, and, and he, you, know, you know, if you like, you know, for example, like, a, I don't know, like a movie, like a Western, and the sheriff comes in and busts open the doors of the saloon, and there he is, and he's six foot four, and he's got his revolver, and he's ready to go, and this is it. This is that scene. So in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And then he said upon him, was called faithful and true, and in the righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So John is sitting, I can't even imagine what this vision was like. John is sitting there, and he's watching God's throne room and everything, and all of a sudden the, the heavens open, and there is Jesus on a white horse. And, and, I can't even imagine what this imagery looked like because it says there his eyes were like flames of fire. He had, uh, uh, it says, many crowns. Later on, we're going to find out. I don't think it's here, but later on, we're going to find out there's a sword coming out of his mouth. His vesture, his garments are dipped in blood, and he's there on top of this horse called Faithful and True. Just an amazing imagery that we see there of Jesus who has come to, uh, again, execute this final judgment. Now, there's no doubt that this is Christ. It says his aims are, his eyes are as flames of fire. You'll remember, again, the, the kind of the full circle that we come to in Revelation. Back in the very first study we ever did, Revelation chapter 1, in verse number 14, Christ is described as having flames of eyes like flames of fire. So, the, you know, it doesn't take a, it, this is real simple. I mean, this is simple. We know what this is because the book of Revelation has already told us what this is. This is Christ. It later says, as I said in chapter 19, that a sword proceeds out of his mouth. Again, in Revelations 1 and 16, Jesus had a sword pursuing out of his mouth. So we know that this is Christ. It says his name is the word of God. In John chapter 1, the Bible says that the word was with God in the very beginning. And then later on, it says the word became flesh in verse number 14, meaning that Jesus was the word of God. So again, it doesn't take a lot to figure out that this person, this imagery that is sitting on top of this horse is Christ. The Bible is pretty express about that. Now, this is the true king. Again, you know, like when you watch some of these movies, you know, it looks like the bad guy's in control of everything. And then the good guy, the sheriff or whatever comes, and, man, he's really the one who has authority. and He puts down the bad guy and saves everything. Well, this is that to the nth degree. I mean, yes, Caesar's had his time on earth. The Caesars have had their time on earth to persecute Christians and to, and to make life miserable for Christians. And Jesus and God have now had enough And here comes Jesus, only in one true king with true power. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and in verse number 8. If I can get over there. Let's 
Sorry, my, my pages are stipping, sticking together a little bit. Ecclesiastes 8 and 8. The Bible there says this, There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver these, these that are given to it. You know one of the things that Caesar couldn't do? Caesar couldn't avoid death. Oh yeah, he, could have, he can raise taxes. He can come to your house and take everything you got. He can take all your land. He can take your family, put them to a sword. But you know what happened to Nero? He died. You know what happened to Domitian? He died. You know what happened to Caligula? He died. You know what happened to Vespasian? He died. And we could go through all the Caesars. Not a one of them lives today. But Christ died. And he rose again. And he lives. There's no man that can do that. But Christ can. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse number 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse number 10. Timothy said, or Paul says this to Timothy, But as now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Abolished death. That's, that's some kind of power. I mean, you know, if somebody abolishes something, that's, that's powerful. You know, sometimes a president can do that. He can abolish a law by vetoing it or maybe with an executive order. There are things that sometimes people just abolish. But death? How would you like to have the ability to just abolish death? Have you ever sat near the bed of a loved one and wished they were going to live again and wished that you could just abolish death? What kind of power would that be? Let me tell you something. Christ has that power, and he did it. And so you know what happened to Nero and Caligula and Vespasian? They sat in Hades waiting to greet each other as they all kind of ticked off the earth. Because they couldn't do anything about death. And let me tell you something. Because we're Christians, there are people that we love and have been very dear to who have gone on. And let me tell you something. They're waiting for us because God abolished death. Yeah, they, they, they're not here anymore, but their soul is on forever. And we will live eternally. And what a wonderful thing that is. The church who was being persecuted needed to know, hey, look, things are bad and you may get a lot of things that happen to you, but... God abolished death. This doesn't matter. Have you ever watched, I wish this would have happened yesterday, have you ever watched a game and know that it's going to turn out okay? I, I do that all the time because, you know, the Longhorns have not been good for like 15 years. And so every once in a while to remember what it's like for the Longhorns to be good, I'll watch the national championship game that Texas won on, in January of 2006, 15 years ago. Okay, more than 15 years ago. Now, the, the thing about that game was that, and I'm sorry to just wax a little here, but Texas was down by, I think, 12 points in the fourth quarter at one point. And when you watch that, you're going, oh, man, I, when it, I was there. And I remember just thinking, oh, we've lost, and there's no way we're going to come back. This is USC. You know what happens when I watch it today? I don't really get, I kind of still sometimes, but not nearly. I mean, I don't feel nearly like I did when I was there. Why? Because I know how it's going to turn out. I know that unless somebody's done some amazing editing, that at the end of this replay of the national championship game, Vince Young is going to take the ball, he's going to run right, he's going to get right past Frosty Rucker, and he's going to run into the end zone, and it's going to be a touchdown, and Texas is going to win the national championship because I know how it ends. Folks, as Christians, we know how this ends. And it takes away a lot of the stress of this life. Don't get wrapped up in this. God's already told us how this is going to end. It's going to end in us being victorious. He has abolished death. It's no more. And so, yeah, there may be troubles in this life, but ultimately we are going to be victorious. Unlike Rome, the Bible says here he's come to make war in righteousness. Rome didn't do that. None of Rome's wars were righteous. Rome's wars were about power and greed and avarice and, and getting more and more land and more and more stuff. That's not what Jesus' wars are about. Jesus is a war of justice, of righteousness, of returning things right. And that is a contrast to the Roman Empire. Uh, finally, his garments are dipped in blood. Some people look at that and go, oh, well, this is talking about Jesus on the cross and the fact that he died for us and he bled, and so therefore he's going, no, that's not what this is, I don't think. That's not what this is. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a verse that we're going to read in just a minute about Jesus treading the wine press of his, of his enemies. There's a reason Jesus' vestment was dipped in blood. It's not because he was on the cross. It's because he has killed his enemies. Now, have you ever seen that imagery? where the good guy like, is ready to execute judgment, he does, and whatever he does is so unbelievably final that he's just, you know, he's dripping with blood because of that. 
It's a gruesome scene. Let me tell you something. That's Christ as, as he enacts his judgment. You do not want to be on the bad side of Christ. That's why these people are saying whenever, remember we have this imagery of Christ as a lamb and this lamb's walking around and people are seeing the lamb going, let the mountains fall on us, let the mountains fall on us. And you're going, it's just a lamb, but it's Christ. And let me tell you something, when Christ comes to exact vengeance, it's a fearful thing, as the Hebrews says, it's a fearful thing to follow the hands of the living God. We need to be careful with Christ and make sure that we follow him. Now, uh, oh, I do want to read this. Go to Isaiah chapter 63 and verse number 1. Isaiah chapter 63 and in verse number 1, because this will give you some uh, context for this. In verse number 1 it says, this is talking about the destruction of Edom. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This is glorious. Uh, this that is glorious is in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trod in the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain, I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I look, and there is none to help, and I wonder that there is none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury upheld me, and I will tread down the people in mine anger and make the and drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Do you want to be on the bad side of God? God says, I'm going to tread them down like a wine press, like somebody who stomps on grapes. It's the imagery. And it's going to be so terrific that my garments are going to be stained by that. So again, that's the imagery that these first Christian Christians would understand. And they see Jesus with his garments dripping in blood. They understand what that means. Jesus has executed judgment. So in verse 14 through 15, it says here, well, here's the wine press reference. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, there's that sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Again, that reference to Isaiah chapter 63 that we just talked about. Here is a vision of Christ's army. It says that he's, with, that he's got folks with him. He's got these armies behind him clothed in white linen. And of course, this seems to be Christ's church. I've got some references there. All of those verses refer to God's, or the two from Revelation, refer to God's people having unsoiled white garments or, or fine linen garments. And so again, this is a reference to Christ's church. Romans 8 and 35 through 37 talks about how nothing shall be held against God's people. They're invincible. And again, that's the, the idea of this army that goes with Christ. It's his church going out. Now, they're going to fight a battle for sure, but not a physical one. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse number 3, the Bible there says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty towards God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every eye thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Some like to look at Revelation and imagine a physical war. You may have heard of the Battle of Armageddon. Everybody's waiting for that. That there's going to be this final battle between nations. And some people think it'll be China. And some people think it'll be other nations. And there's going to be this big battle. It's not what this is talking about. Paul even says, we don't fight physical battles. That's not what God is about. It's not about a physical battle. It's about a spiritual one. And so he talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Yet people miss that verse and they begin to think of Revelation as describing some kind of physical battle that's going to happen, which is certainly not the case. Some more references for you. As 2 Corinthians says, the weapons are not carnal. It says there that there's this sword that proceeds out of Jesus' mouth. And that sword, we know, is the Word of God. It it's says there that it's the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12, talking about this, it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of the Spirit will pierce us and cause us to think differently and to live differently for God. It is a spiritual weapon, not a carnal one. The rod that Jesus carries is, is a reference back to, again, imagery in the Old Testament. In the second psalm and in the ninth verse, there when God is talking about, uh, or when David is talking about God, he says there in, in uh, verse number nine, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Isaiah 11 and 4 also talks about this rod of iron. And, and earlier in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number five, Jesus is pictured with a rod. And so again, these are instruments that God uses 
to carry out this spiritual warfare that Revelation chapter 19 is talking about. And the result is Christ and his armies tread their great enemies like grapes in a wine press. God will ultimately be victorious, which is ultimately the imagery that we see here. As we move on to Revelation 19, verse 16, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So we hear the name of Christ. Now earlier, as you may have noticed this as we were reading, it says that when it's talking about faithful and true, it says he has a name that no man can name uh, or that no man knew. And what that really is talking about is the uniqueness of Christ, that nobody has a name like him. And then we're told later on that his name is the Word of God. Remember that verse earlier in our study today. Talked about him being the Word of God. That's a reference to his divine authority because he, has, he is inspired by the Word of God. Now we're told that he's King of King and Lord of Lords. And that's a reference to Christ's superiority over all other rulers. So not only does he have divine authority, he's unique, he has divine authority from God, and he's better than any king or lord that you may know, including Caesar. Jesus is supreme. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so, you know, sometimes people like to say, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And I know what they're trying to say, but the fact of the matter is you can't. You can't do that. You cannot make Jesus the Lord of your life. He is already Lord. Now, you can elect to follow him and acknowledge him as Lord and conform your life to what he wants to say, but he's Lord of you whether you want it or not. And you're going to know that on the day of judgment because Jesus and God are going to do exactly what they want to do with you on the day of judgment according to their justice and divine mercy and pardon. And so, you know, again, we can talk about whether Jesus is Lord of our life or not, and that really speaks to our action, but it doesn't speak to whether God is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and he always will be Lord over us. Acts chapter 2 and 36 talks about this, and we won't belabor that. Verses 17 through 18, so we can get through the rest of this. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Ever seen the movie Birds? <laughs> uh, uh, Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock, that's what it is. The, 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 the movie The Birds, where they come and attack people. That's kind of the imagery here. What happens is, is that there's all these birds in heaven, and they're invited to come and to eat the flesh of the kings. We've had a lot of gruesome imagery today. The reading today was... Pretty, uh, pretty stout about Joab and what he was doing uh, along the highway and everything else. And now we've got birds eating kings. But I'm sorry, this is kind of a PG-13 lesson, I guess. But um, in any event, very, very gruesome imagery of birds coming and eating these kings. And so that stands in stark contrast to the wedding, right? I mean, the people of God are having a wedding. I mean, they're partying, and here comes birds, and they go eat God's people. That's not a good day if you're not one of God's people, or not God's people, the kings. And so this imagery is used to describe God's judgment of his injuries, of his enemies. In Exodus chapter 39 and verse number 17, Exodus chapter 39 and verse number 17, similar imagery again, this continual going back to the Old Testament. In verse number 17 it says, And they put the, the two wreath chains of gold and the two rings on... The, well, let me make sure I've got this right. Exodus chapter 39, 17 through 20. I have clearly messed that up. So I, I apologize. I will get you the, there is a reference to God's fall, and it may be, let me, try, let me see if I messed up and made it Ezekiel real quick. Let me see if that's the imagery that I was, or the reference that I was looking for there. Yeah, uh, Ezekiel chapter 39. I just, I hit uh, X instead of uh, uh, doing Ezekiel, so I apologize. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 17 through 20. And thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl, birds, and to every beast of the earth, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side of my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of goats, of bullocks, and all the fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat fat till you be full and drunk blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus shall ye be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. So, again, a clear reference back to this verse here. Same imagery, birds eating kings. That was used to describe the destruction of Edom, which was an evil empire back then. It's being used here to describe the destruction of Rome, which was an evil empire at the time 
of the book of Revelation. So again, one of those things that we can look at to know that he's talking about the destruction of a kingdom. Notice that no one is spared. They are eating both small and great. So again, while it's true that you don't have to be a great person to uh, follow God, you also don't have to be a great person to get God's judgment. God's judgment just wasn't going to be against Nero and Caligula. It was going to be against everybody who followed Nero and Caligula or anybody else in this world other than God. And so again, both small and great were going to be judged. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 34. Acts chapter 10 and verse number 34. The Bible there says this. It says, um, then Peter opposed his, opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Either way, God is not a respecter of persons, and we need to understand that. And that means that Caesar and his generals and everybody that followed him would be feasted on by these birds. They would be destroyed. Then finally, the last set of verses. Sorry, we're going a little longer than I thought. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So again, these, this, these birds come and there's this final battle where the beast and the kings of the earth go to make war and they are destroyed. Now, in this verse, we see again characters that we've seen before in our study of the book of Revelation. We see um, this destruction has been depicted a few times before in talking about it from different perspectives in Revelation chapter 14 and Revelation chapter 16. In Daniel 2 and verse number 44, I'd like to turn over there real quickly as our, probably our last reading of today. Daniel chapter 2 and in verse number 44. There, when Daniel is talking about his prophecy and about what is going to happen, you'll, and you'll remember, this is the prophecy where Daniel... For those of you who have not studied this, in Daniel chapter 2, there's this image that Daniel sees of a great, uh, a great image. And, and through that image that Daniel sees, he predicts the next four kingdoms by name. It's an amazing prophecy. He says there's the Babylonian Empire that exists now. After that is going to come the Medes and the Persians. After that is going to come the Grecian Empire. And then finally, in verse number 44 of Daniel chapter 2, and in verse number 44 it says, and in the days of these kings shall God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all those kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Talking about the Roman Empire. In the days of the Roman Empire, God is going to set up a kingdom. And what that was is his church. When Jesus died on the cross and his church was founded, we now have a kingdom that is never going to be gone away with, and that is the church. And so again, as we see this, this is God's victory over this final kingdom where he is setting up his church forever. Now, who is against Christ and his followers? Here, it's the sea beast, this beast it talks about. Remember, we talked about that earlier, that this beast referenced royal Rome, its military power. And then we have this false prophet that is causing people to worship the beast. That was the earth beast that we talked about earlier, and we talked about that it was religious Rome. That was Rome not only being powerful, but compelling people to worship Caesars. So these two aspects of Rome, its royal nature and its religious nature, are, 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 are and I said earth bast, earth beast, um, are thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed. Now, is this the final judgment? Well, fire and brimstone sounds like the final judgment, doesn't it? But fire and brimstone don't always mean the final judgment. For example, Sodom and Gomorrah were killed with, uh, with fire and brimstone. And in Isaiah chapter 34 and verse number 9, there's a reference there. I'll keep my promise about that being the last verse. Isaiah 34, 9 and 10 talks about fire and brimstone being used for God's judgment. The point here is that the rest of those with Rome are destroyed. And Rome has executed final judgment here. And so that's really the point of that, uh, uh, of that verse. It says there that they are destroyed with the sword. And that means not a physical sword, but again, as we've talked about, this word. So we are judged by God's word. And we're found either in Christ or outside of Christ by his word, which is, what, of course, what we understand as, as the church. And there's no physical battle. This is not a battle of Armageddon with helicopters and tanks. This is Jesus and God warring spiritual warfare in the world through their church, which is what this reference is to. In Exodus, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, is the verses that we read a lot that talk about the full armor of God, put on the armor of God. And whenever, Jesus, whenever Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the armor of God, he's not telling Scott to go get his Kevlar vest on because there's going to be a big battle in Megiddo and he needs to be able to, to withstand the bullets of the Chinese army. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is put on your spiritual army armor because there's a spiritual battle going on. The battle of Armageddon, this battle that we're talking about, is going on right now. It is a war between God and his church, 
and Satan and his influence in this world, and you're a part of that. You get to choose. You don't, you don't, you don't get to be neutral. There's no Switzerland in this fight. You're either going to you're either going to follow after God or you're not. And if you're not after God, you're not going to follow after. You're going to be against him. And so we have to make that choice. This morning, you have an opportunity to make that choice. If you have not yet obeyed Christ, if you have not yet acknowledged him, not made him, but acknowledged him as Lord of your life, if you have not yet decided that you are going to follow his commandments, you have that opportunity to do so now. Folks, the stakes could not be higher. We've talked about that. Don't be on the side of God's justice. That's the last thing you want on the day of judgment. You're not going to be begging for justice. You're going to be screaming for mercy. You're going to be screaming for pardon. And the great news is God freely gives that to you if you will follow him. And there is no doubt about that. There is no uncertainty about that. We will know that we have a home in heaven. And what a confidence that should give us. If you're here and you have not yet named the name of Christ, we would love to help you this morning. You can come forward and we can help you name the name of Christ, obey him in baptism, and be added to his kingdom. We'd love to do that. Or if you're here and you need the prayers of the church for any reason, won't you please come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.